what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Ben Glass. He's of great legal marketing in Ben Glass Law. I will formally introduce Ben in a second. Ben, I always like to talk about other episodes people should check out on the podcast, you know, and a mutual friend, Brian Kurtz. I think he's the most guested on my show out of any guest. Um, I think maybe I've had him three or four times. Amazing uh, guest and direct response genius. And I love, and, and Ben does too, geek out on direct response marketing. Um, I had Ron Popeil on, if anyone's heard of Ron Popeil, he's like the infomercial king. Unfortunately, he passed away this year, but um, he, you know, if you've heard, but wait, there's more, that's Ron Popeil. So check him out, Perry Marshall, and and there's many, many more. Uh, ben, who are your favorites uh, direct response? I know you're going to say Dan Kennedy, but who are your favorite people of all time in direct response that you've learned from? So I think so I think Kennedy for sure. Jay Abraham is is another great guy that I've learned from. Uh, you know, and I think the so the youngins, Jeremy, they miss going back and reading the Al Reese's um, and these these his the books about advertising and direct response when we didn't have the internet, when TV was limited, when you had coupons, people had to mail checks back to like going and understanding that history because the principles of direct response marketing don't change. Why? Because we're dealing with human beings, right? Interestingly, I'm a lawyer. It's the same principles that apply when I'm speaking to a jury. It's the same thing. I'm dealing with human beings on the other side who are going to make an emotional decision and back, try to back it up with logic, right? So a lot of parallels there. And, and again, anyone who's in this world who, who doesn't have a library, I see your part of, part of your library behind you, uh, of, of, of the history of advertising and marketing and great advertising uh, really is missing an opportunity um, uh, to excel in, a highly, in, in whatever field. It's highly crowded, right? It's uber competitive today. Do you have other favorite books you mentioned? I, th- I think, uh, is it the uh, Immutable Laws of Marketing? Was Al Reese and someone else? Uh, Dan Kennedy, Jay Abraham has a bunch of books. Any other favorite uh, marketing or direct response books? I love Joe Sugarman. Joe Sugarman was another guest on my podcast and a friend. Unfortunately, he passed away recently, but he is one of my favorite copywriting direct response books of all time as well. So I would say anything in Kennedy's library, the No BS, no BS series. Um, I would say, um, you know, bringing to modern, but it's still principle based is any Russell Brunson's current work um, is great. And of course, our friend uh, Brian Kurtz, who you mentioned earlier, his book, although it's not all about direct response marketing, his book Over Delivered, or Over Delivered, I think, is is an amazing book about how to be a person of influence um, without standing up on top of a of a of a, you know, a big shelf or big stage and saying, hey, look at me, the light's all on me. And Brian is, a, is the expert um, bar none on that. Love it. Yeah, for sure. Over deliver. Um, and Perry Marshall's book, um, uh, The 80-20 of Sales and Marketing is a good one too. Um, so this episode is brought to you by Rise25. Uh, by the way, as Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect their Dream 100 relationships. How do we do that? We help you run your podcast. You know, for me, uh, Ben, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to do that over the past decade than to profile the people and the companies I most admire on this planet and feature them and, and shout from the rooftops what they're working on and share their knowledge with the world as well. So if you thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. Uh, we've been doing it for over a decade and you can email support at rise25.com if you have questions. We probably have created been free so many episodes that people can just learn for free on our podcast so they can check that out as well. And Ben Glass um, has been a personal injury lawyer, I think, Ben, at this point for over 40 years, right? Uh, And uh, almost 40, almost 40 years. Okay. I don't want to age you, but I I think I read somewhere 40 years and like, well, 40 years plus. Uh Um, And, but the most impressive thing is he's a father of nine children, four of them adopted from China. Uh, he's a small business advocate, a nonprofit charity supporter, and 
uh, a soccer referee. Okay. And he got a scholarship for playing soccer. Um, so he could hold his own. And uh, if you're watching the video, um, you could see he's got many books, like business books, legal books, but you, a teenage soccer referee. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and he's a recognized expert. I mean, lawyers Ben travel from around the country to be trained by you and your team uh, at the Ben Glass Center for Growth and Innovation. And you run not just Ben Glass Law, but the great legal marketing uh, and you help law firms all over the country. I, I mean, you're kind of, I mean, I have heard about you for years and years and years, um, even though I'm not a lawyer, um, just a, you know, names come up of people who are really, really smart at helping people in business. Um, so when, you know, that's, you can find his uh, Ben Glass Law and Great Legal Marketing. Um, and you've authored several books, The Truth About Lawyer Advertising, Five Deadly Sins That Can Wreck Your Accident Case, and many more. So Ben, thanks for joining me. Awesome. We can, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's a very nice introduction, Jeremy. Yeah. And, you know, the work you do is very important. And, and you're following a basic principle philosophy of life, which is, asking the question always like, what can I do for you first? Right. And, and, and being the giver of your talent and gifts, that's what makes the world go around. And that's, I think my space in the world is to, is to try to get people to recognize you are special. You have gifts, you have talents. Let's not hide them. Let's use them. We're going to dig deep into how does one get to the point where you get to the, all the stuff you don't want to do, you don't have to do anymore. And sometimes it's a mindset thing, but I want to start with the nine kids. You know, because obviously that jumps out and people probably hear that and like, I have one kid, I have two kids, I and I'm swamped, right? And so there was a major decision you made at some point to expand your family. Um, so just talk about that thought process, you know, with your wife and, and yeah, why. And yeah, sure. And we've been swamped. And so, you know, the... the I've written part about this in, in uh, uh, my book called Play Left Fullback. We had four kids and a dog. Sandy is my wife and says, you know, I think we we're called to adopt. And I said, you're crazy. We have four kids and a dog. We have a very full life. Uh, there's a gap. There's about an eight-year gap between child number four and, and child number eight. Child number eight just, or, or child number five, right? He just graduated now from, from Virginia Tech. And uh, Matt came along. and. My wife said, I think we're, we're called to adopt. And I said, well, you know, you're really crazy. Meanwhile, my sister, who, who couldn't have children, um, adopted it. And, and so through that, we kind of saw the process of international adoption. She adopted from China as well. We went to a Stephen Curtis Chapman concert. I don't know if you're familiar with the Christian music genre. Stephen Curtis Chapman is a very, very popular, longtime uh, artist and advocate for adoption. He adopted um, uh, girls from China. And that changed my our whole life because at that concert, I said yes. And 18 months after that, we were in, in Beijing. Adopting. Did you really have a choice when your wife said we're called to adopt at that point? Um, yeah, I, mean, I did. You well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for, okay. for sure, because I had said no. I had said no several mm. times, but that, that's too much. That concert and God speaking through Stephen Chris Chapman changed my heart. And 18 months later, we're in China with Kevin. Kevin just turned 20. Um, a couple of years after that, we're in China again to adopt six and a half year old Emma. A couple of years after that, Sandy shows me, hey, there's this video on the Internet, because now there was more video. In the beginning, we didn't have a lot of information. A video of two children, one 12, one 11 in an orphanage playing. And, and there was a group that was advocating, Jeremy, for older child adoption. When you're 14 in China, you're no longer adoptable. Right? You stay in the social welfare system. Um, and and so again, we were we were all in, and uh, you know, at different times, you know, one of or, or both of us would be really frightened and scared. We didn't know what we were getting into, um, and the other would hold each other up, which is a great for parenting thing. It's how it, 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 it's it's how you don't get overwhelmed when you've got more than two, right? Because one changes your life, two you're even usually with your spouse, three you're outnumbered, and now you got to figure out like how we can do it. As a as a as a family unit, um, and so uh, adopted uh, David and Leah. They were twelve and eleven. Uh, they both still speak Mandarin. Um, um, you know, it's it's been a journey, and it's been. And I will say this too quickly: is that being born in an orphanage, being 
abandoned by your parents as a child. All of my kids had some physical um, imperfection, let's just say. Um, that creates, that's early childhood trauma. It's a it whole set of new challenges. Older. It's it's a ton. And But here's a, here's the interesting thing is that our kids have given more to us than we ever could have imagined because we've learned so much brain science over the years. And and a big, because you, you're famous for asking about like turning points. A big turning point was when we would, we would start to go and seek out experts and attend conferences. And it would be in a room with hundreds of other parents who were in the same place as we were. Some of them were farther, obviously farther along the experience path. And just hearing those stories and hearing, um, uh, you know, resources that they had reached out to and hearing hope, that was very helpful to us, which gets to something, you know, you and I talk about, which is, you know, they're getting into groups and playing in groups of people who are farther along, whatever it is, a business path. In that case, it was a raising children from hard places path, whatever it is, masterminding with people is really, really critical. So, <clears throat> so here we are. We're um, got a, a couple are still at home. They'll need uh, probably our assistance for a long time. The whole bunch are home from college <laughs> and, and a bunch of my kids are, are launched. We've, we just had our sixth and seventh grandkids in the last six weeks of so two of our daughters. Uh, Congratulations. Yeah, it's a big, it's a, I, I, the other, last week I looked up at the dinner table, there's nine of us around the dinner table. Like, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> you know, I'm fascinated, Ben, by people who make decisions that are, there, there's a path that's harder and they consciously make that decision because, so my wife's a child psychologist. So, uh, and so adopting, she's worked with, but, you know, kids are adopted, obviously, but, you know, adopting from young age versus older, there's a lot more baggage, right? And so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what, what was that decision like ago? You know, you could adopt two more kids and they could be, you know, one, two, three, four, as opposed to 10, 11, 12. Yeah. Well, <laughs> at certain point, from our Christian faith belief, at a certain point, you believe or you have this feeling that you are called to something and that there's a reason you are called. And it can, you know, it can border on sounding arrogant, right? Um, and I don't want it to be that way, but it's like, okay, this is the unknown. These children, their lives would have been profoundly different. And especially now, I mean, China is a much darker, more restrictive, kind of horrible place to live, actually. Um, but it's not like we saved them from that. But that certainly was part of the thinking then. I think it's like wrong thinking now in retrospect. Um, and you just take and you just take on. So part of my mantra is you live life big, right? You, you, you have this one journey, Jeremy, through life. There's no do-overs. We can wish we were 18 again, but that's not going to happen. Um, and you don't have any control over when you're born, who you're born to. You have maybe some influence on how long you get to stay here on Earth. And let's just go for it. We're, we're, we're blessed. We live in America. We live in our uh, and I in Northern Virginia. We have uh, tons of resources available to us locally, which not everybody in America has in terms of mental health teams and, and physical health teams and all that stuff. It's one of those things that's not really rationally totally explainable. And I will, I will say this, to be fair, there were times when we, we would say to ourselves, man, how did we get here? Like, this is really, really hard. Um, and of course, you know, friends and family don't always understand the thought process. They don't understand why you make these choices and why you've made your life more challenging at certain points. And so there's isolation, <laughs> there's loneliness until you find other people who are on this path um, with you and they are out there. And so today, all of that much pain, much work, much stress, now kids are doing really well. And Sandy and I are mentors to the next cohort of families. So what I always say when I do podcasts like this is like, if you know someone who's thinking about adoption or someone who has adopted and, and they are being challenged, like they're, they're finding it challenging, reach out to me, reach out to Sandy. We are, we don't have PhDs after our name. We have a 
crap ton of experience, right? And we're really good at pointing people, as your wife probably is, to here's a resource, here's a person, here's an idea. We're really good at that. Born of a lot of challenging times. So we'll, you know, when I, we first got on this call, the first thing you said was about being grateful. And we'll, we'll, ta- we'll kind of transition the, the family into business for a second, because there's, there's business grateful, and then there's, you know, being grateful for family. And I'd love to hear, what were some of the conditions you learned about in these facilities? Um, was there anything that sticks out? you know, when we're just thinking personally, like, wow, that you had no idea that you uncovered through your research in, and also experience with adopting. Yeah. we uncovered through my kids telling us stories, the older ones. So, um, my son, one of my sons, uh, lived in a, in a nice, with a nice foster family. And he's actually has traveled back to China and visited his foster parents and, and sometimes chat with them through video. But as he was um, uh, nearing a time where he could potentially uh, be adopted, you know, he was basically ripped from his foster family and put back into an institution, uh, an an orphanage. An orphanage is not a good place where he basically had to join a gang within the orphanage, right, in order to survive. Saw a child killed, right? That's trauma. Um, I would say this too, that no matter, and the Chinese people are wonderful, wonderful people. The government is, and the leader is, you know, it's a horrible place. The Chinese people are by and large very wonderful, but no matter how loving or caring uh, uh, a nanny in an orphanage is, they have a lot of kids, right? And my, 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 one of my sons who had a severe cleft lip and palate was unrepaired at the time we adopted him. You know, you need a long time to be fed and you need holding and you don't get that. And so, um, you know, no matter how caring they were, it's different from the love of a mom and a dad, the love of parents. Right. Um, And the security and the felt safety that our children, by and large, have ours, yours and yours and mine. You know, most most children in America have at least felt safety, that they'll be fed, they'll be sheltered, someone will come pick them up when they're crying, someone will advocate for them. These kids didn't really have that. And it can have a profound impact. The early, the first 18 months of life can have a profound impact because the brain is being wired, right? I didn't know any of this. I didn't know any of this. We've learned it by, you know, by being forced into this world that that we didn't know we had to go to and and now we've learned. So that's just a couple, I mean, it's a lot. Now, I don't wanna, I don't wanna scare anyone who's considering this, uh, considering adoption to go, oh my, this is way hard because we heard stories before, you know, we heard some horror stories. We just don't know what you don't know. And so what our message is, Sandy and my message today is, you have to be willing to work really hard. I do think this works better if there's two two adults involved, right? It can be a mom and a dad, a mom and a mom, dad and dad. That doesn't make a difference. But two adults, it takes that energy because someone's always tired and someone's always frustrated. And to have two people who can tag team with each other uh, and 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 go out and get ideas, that's really, I think, my opinion, that's really, really important. There are single parents who adopt. Bless them. Bless them. That's the most challenging thing you can imagine. How do you feel about partnerships in business? I'm sure you get a lot of questions and have helped people sort stuff out, right? Because I could see that same yeah. apply to business, but there's also, there can be issues with that as well. Yeah. So I, I'm in the law partnership with my oldest son, Brian. Um, I'm the sole owner of Great Legal Marketing. Um, in At least in law, Jeremy, so many law partnerships of s- small firms um, are, are born of this. Jeremy, well, I like you. I think it would be fun to practice together. What if we did that and kind of split the overhead and, and did that? And we don't have a vision for five years, which would be really fun to practice. And, that, and that's how those firms are born. And a lot of firms go through their whole life that way. Um, and I'm, I'm just... 
I, I guess I'm no longer shocked, Jeremy, of how many small businesses do the, they create the business and whether it's with a partnership or not, they create the business because it looks like it would be a fun thing to, I'm a good dog groomer. I'm a good hairdresser. I'm good at building decks, right? Cool. They create a job. Cool. Um, but there's no real proactive thinking about five years from now, this is where we want to be. 10 years from now, this is where we want to be. So we can take deliberate steps. So I tell lawyers who are partners or thinking about becoming partners is you have, yeah, the first discussion you have to have is when this ends, either because we're tired of each other or one of us gets dies or has a disability, like how does, how does that play out? We have to write that all down. That's like number one. What's the, what's the, you're writing down the prenup. Like how does it, how does this deal end? And second is, you know, it's really, really helpful if for lawyers in particular, if are, are we running a law practice or are we going to run a business and we just happen to be lawyers and we're going to, apply business principles, we're going to look outside the lawyer box for um, how other successful businesses are run, how they hire, how they come. And that's what my great legal marketing business is about. It's about attracting those lawyers. Uh, we mentioned before we went live, we mentioned my friend Brian Beckham was a terrific attorney down in Houston. We're attracting guys like that who are entrepreneurial. They're really good lawyers. And when you combine really good lawyers with really good business principles, there's no top. <laughs> there's no limit. Lots of really good lawyers, Jeremy, this shouldn't probably will not surprise you, are frustrated. They don't make enough money. They don't like the practice. And I believe it's because they've never ventured outside the lawyer black box to see how does the guy running the bagel shop or the lady running, you know, whatever, the car dealership, how do they, who are the, who are happy? Like, what do they do? What are their habits? What principles do they apply to their life and to their business? And that's what I bring to the world, I think, is showing the lawyers who want to be this, want to be happy, like show them, okay, here's the steps to take. Here's the steps to take in this order, frankly. What's the commonality you see, Ben, of, of lawyers who are happy? Lawyers who are happy, um, a, they have set their own ego aside about who is going to do the bulk of the legal work, right? Lawyers, so lawyers who are happy, you know, we say you have high profit, low maintenance law firm. Well, in order to have high profit, low maintenance, you can't be the one doing every case, answering every email. Um, and so that's where we get them to, high profit, uh, low maintenance. Lawyers who are happy have, this is interesting, Jeremy, they've given themselves permission to be happy, first of all, because what you learn in law school is that you have to be a self-sacrificial lamb to the client and to the profession and to the community, and you have to work all these hours and you have to run your way up the hard ladder, and, 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 and then in 40 years, you can be successful, right? And so our lawyers and I didn't, I see, I didn't understand this when I began, but I do now. Our lawyers like, no, who made that rule? Like, that sounds stupid, right? Let's be, let's bring happiness far forward in the, in the, uh, in the progression through the profession. So give yourself permission to think that way first. Um, and then just the, the, the lawyer, like we talked about like sort of personal ego of, I have to be the one to do all the work, but now also ego of, of, yeah, we're actually going to bring in the, the idea of the bagel baker who, down the street who gets client customers and they come back and repeat. Like, we're going to, even though he's not a lawyer, <laughs> we're going to go ask him some questions and be curious about that. And those lawyers, um, and then they hire. I and mean, we talk all about sort of hiring and culture and, and unleashing your employees on the world, right? Those lawyers have a hot, much higher likelihood, Jeremy, of being happy. Uh, subtitle of one of my first book of my first book, which was called Great Legal Marketing, was how to make more money, get more cases, and still be home in time for dinner. Right, that's happiness. I want to talk about hiring in a second, but you know, you mentioned uh, Brian Beckham. I know we talked about Mark Breyer, and do you feel that there's an identity crisis 
do they come to you kind of already with that shift of, I want to be the owner and not the doer, or is that a shift they have to make? Cause I feel like there could be like an identity crisis there. Cause they, you know, you identify as your profession, right? Not the CEO of the company, but the, the, the lawyer. Yeah. yeah. So for both of them, I think they would say, yes, they have had an identity change. Ben has had an identity change because, you know, I'm also from that school of thought, like we are lawyers. So most lawyers come to us wanting to increase revenue by getting more and better clients. They want to solve the advertising and the marketing problem. When Great Legal Marketing was born over 17 years ago, that's really all we did. We showed lawyers how to advertise. We showed small lawyers, small firm lawyers, how to keep up with what was at the time, you know, yellow pages and TV. Like that was the, that was the media that was on pre-internet. Um, and what, what happens is, Jeremy, that's a relatively easy problem to solve. There's, it's systematic um, to, to get more clients and to get better clients, either um, higher fee paying clients or you know, larger cases if you're a personal injury lawyer like I am. That then causes problems, right? Because now we, um, now we do need to have employees who can fulfill. We need processes. We need systems. Uh, we need um, structure. And so, but in order to help, in order to build that and to be the, the coach of all of that, it takes time. And so you, you're almost squeezed out of doing the legal work yourself. And again, for Ben, that was hard. Wow. Like nobody could do this as good as I could. Um, the legal work. Oh, yeah, they can. And so those guys that we mentioned, Mark um, uh, and Brian, Brian Beckham, they are today true CEOs. I mean, they, you still see them involved in a legal case or two if you look, if you follow them around for a week, but mainly they're coaching, not managing, coaching their team and unleashing them, unleashing their team's talents on the world. And that makes it better for the lawyer, owner. It makes it better for the clients too, right? This, the level of service goes up. And when you do that, then you're, you're great for your community as well. So we can solve all the problems that lawyers are trying to solve when they go to law school. Like, but we just eliminate the work real hard, climb this traditional ladder of 2,000, 2,500 hours 2,800 hours a year billable time. That's old and nonsense. I mean, lawyers come to you then, and in, in this sense, you know, the company is the great legal marketing. So you give them what they want. And essentially, then when they get there, you give them what they need. Is that the case? Yeah. And a big part of what they need is the personal development. It's, it is the mindset stuff. It is the, I deserve not that they're entitled to, but I deserve to be happy. It's going to take work. The world doesn't owe me happiness just because I have a law degree. And today, Jeremy, you know, young lawyers coming out of law school are dropping out on 150K, right, to get their law degree. Um, so that doesn't entitle you to anything. But, you, but just because you're a lawyer does not mean that you do not deserve to be happy even early on. And, you know, we work mainly, we're almost exclusively with lawyer owners, right? Um, but if that lawyer owner is happy, then all the lawyers who work for that lawyer owner are going to be happy. They're going to be coached. And one day they may go compete. We can talk about that. We view that as a win, win, win. Like America is a win, 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 like unlimited opportunity. Is that a common thing you get is... Hey, do you have other people who are in my region in your group, or is that not in their mind? Um, yeah, yes, it is. Hey, if I join and there's another lawyer who's you know in the same state, could be four hours away here in Virginia. Like, what if we both start using the same advertising? Sure. What I what I tell people, Jeremy, is I've been doing this for forty years in the practice of law. I bring local lawyers in. If a local lawyer who competes with me wanted to see everything we did, I would lay it all out on the table and I would explain it to them. A, 90% of them are going to go, that's too much, too hard. It won't do it. The 10% who get really curious about it are going to do it with their own flavor, with their own unique avatar client that they want. And everybody, 
everybody looks for slightly different clientele. And so you have different messaging, you have different capacity to buy media. Um, you have different uh, personal goals. So we hear it, we debunk it. Not everybody believes me, right? But, it's uh, an abundance mentality mindset. Hundred, I think a hundred percent. And we, and we, we just, again, that's, I tell them that that story. So I, I brought local lawyers in here and showed them. Everything. I've had local lawyers in my mastermind group, show them everything, right? They hear everything. Boom. They're, the world is a plenty. <laughs> you know, you talk then about the importance of team uh, a lot. And uh, I'd love to hear some, some hiring, you know, starts with the hiring process and, maybe hiring mistakes, what you've seen or what you've seen some of your clients do that, that maybe other people can avoid? Well, I think that pre-hiring, you have to understand um, really what your own culture is. We often talk in terms of core values. Uh, my team is doing a reread of a Good to Great, Jim Collins' fantastic book. Yes, it's old. The principles are 100% still correct. And so being really clear, and when we talk about core values, Jeremy, it, that means how do we treat each other in, inside these walls? Like how do we debate, discern, respect, um, try to make it a great, a great place? So, so let me, let me and we'll, I'll get to your hiring question here in a second. But the other thing I think people would be interested in knowing is when Brian, my son, and I ask ourselves, like, why do we exist as a, as a law firm? Most, if you hear from most law firms, it's going to be, why do we exist? Well, we exist to help people. We exist to, you know, be aggressive. We exist to get you the divorce you deserve, whatever it is. We said, no, we exist to build a place where people will thrive. First, our people, our people. You come here to work here. This will be the best place you ever worked. You will grow as an individual. You will not want to leave. You will want to invite your best friends who are a good match into work with us. Doesn't mean you won't leave because we, we hire a lot of youngins who are still in school, who are you know growing in their careers. But every decision we make is around that core, which is this will be the best place you ever worked. We want you to thrive here. Because if my team, Jeremy, is feels like they're thriving, they come to work. They like coming to work. They're doing work that's interesting to them. They're compensated appropriately. And they're doing work with other people in this building who they really like. That seems unbeatable. I'm convinced I could take this whole group and we could go open up a bagel bakery or a print shop or whatever. The only thing we would need is subject matter expertise in that area. And my team would be, we, we could build a winning business. So, now to your question, which is about hiring, which is, okay, we only want people who we believe match our core beliefs about the world, which is in part asking, what can I do for you? All right. Um, advocating for yourself. Hey, Ben, perfect would be, I need these three things. Ben can't promise I can always deliver perfect, but I need people who advocate for themselves on that, right? I want people who are curious, who are forever learners, who will, who will, you know, press the leadership. Why do we do things this way? I've got another, I've got a different idea. Here's how I, I you know, and I've thought it out, right? We want people who are proactive, Stephen Covey's habit of, of owning that space between the stimulus and the response. Now. It's hard to know when you hire that, that a person meets your core values as, as well as you would like them. Um, so we'll, we'll get to it there in a sec. Our ads are not paralegal needed, uh, three to five years experience, salary negotiable, can multitask, because that's BS. That's what everybody is. Our ads are like, this would be a good place for you if, boom, boom, boom. This is not the right place for you if, boom, 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 right? Um, Gary Halbert, long format, if you're familiar with his ad, 
when he was looking for a wife or a girlfriend, right? And, and if you if you never heard of this story and you're listening to this podcast, Google Gary Halbert long ad for girlfriend. Go read it, model it, right? Um, and, and now, okay, so so that narrows the pool and it gets people who are much closer to a core value, good higher match. Now you and them have to agree that over 90 days, we're going to date. <laughs> and over 90 days, if, if this is in the right place for you, you're going to tell me. And if I don't think it's the right place for you, I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to pay you for the next month. I'm going to pay you for the, you know, the 120 days. Um, and, and there's no guarantee you'll be here after 90 days, but we are going to work hard to make sure that we are a good match. Because again, I want you to be around for a long time. Mistakes that people make are, and, and Ben has made is, is hiring without a purpose. Like we want to grow, but, but we're not asking these questions. We're running generic ads to get people who don't have jobs to come here and start here. Um, the mis other mistake that Ben has made is that uh, Jeremy, like you're a C plus player, but I could coach you up to an A player, right? And, and feeling like really confident where that hasn't worked out, where I really should be spending my time coaching my A players and helping my C plus players find a new place to work, right? And we tell them that. And we, we, uh, we tell them in, a, in, in our, I do a core values meeting and speech to a new hire. By the way, I meet the new hires on their first day of work. So I'm not involved in that process at all. So again, delegation of that whole deal. But we tell people, um, you know, on our um, on, on our core, my core value to talk to them is we believe that that work is a force for good. And we believe that you should only work at a place that you like working at, uh, you're, you're compensated right, and it's the best thing for your life. And I actually have a story on this. Um, and if at some time you don't feel, Jeremy, that this is the best thing for your life, I will help you find that next spot, right, in your journey through, through life and your journey through the work. So hiring is hard, especially in, in this market. We're recording this summer of 22. Um, the labor market is, is thin. Uh, people want more money. Uh, so we're going to see, uh, uh, you know, the cost for labor to go up. People want to work virtually. That will work in some industries. It won't work in others. It will work with some people and not work enough uh, for others. And, and the, the wisest business owners are in mastermind groups with other business owners, you know, um, intermixing, like not just lawyers, but lawyers and podiatrists and bagel beggars and and, and we're trying to figure this out because um, it's critical. Because if I have a great team, they don't need me. I can get out of my job then is to get out of the way. Once they're there, Ben, what do you do to foster the culture? Yeah, so in, in our law firm um, specifically, a uh, couple of things. Number one, we have kind of rotating where leadership is taking out people sort of randomly selected and, and in small groups, two or three of them across departments, and we're having lunches, number one. Number two, we, are, uh, we have a monthly meeting, a monthly luncheon, right, where we're giving update on the firm, we're doing something fun, and we are, we are doing some exercise where one or more of them are getting on their feet and presenting something. It could be presenting interesting cases we've worked on. It could be, hey, Jeremy, you, we have a young lady here who lived in Japan and, and taught English to uh, Japanese students. Great. You're going to do Japanese 101 for us, okay? Just 101 version A. <laughs> um, uh, things like that. We have um, uh, quarterly, um, all day, uh, business planning meetings here and so with leadership and so within the next week after that we have a meeting hey this is what came out of that business planning meeting here's our goals we have goals on posters for revenue and profit and number of cases and things like that but i think the most important thing we do jeremy is we reinforce this which is i need to know if you're working for me jeremy i need to know what's perfect for you again I can't guarantee it. When COVID started and people were, you know, businesses were closed down, buildings were closed. Um, Brian and I were always here. Uh, but we said to people, we had single moms with kids, right? That was tough. We, we said, we don't know anything about this worldwide pandemic. We don't know how to handle it. There's no book. I need to know from you, like, 
think about it. What would we, we like you? We want you to still work here. Well, how, how is that going to work? Do you need childcare assistance? Do you need change of hours? Do you need to be able to come in here to get work done? Right? Because working at home isn't perfect, but we made sure that our people knew that they could advocate for themselves. And Brian and I did our very best. Uh, to fulfill everybody's wish and try to be fair and all that stuff. Running a business is not easy. It's, and, and few businesses, I, I'll tell you this, there are, our folks, you know, they've come from the working world. They go to other meetings and groups with folks who work in other firms. Nobody out there is treating their employees with the openness, I think, that we do, right? Like, this is a team. We want you here. I need to hear your voice. Yeah, that, that's it's a collaborative approach instead of just commanding, here's what our policy is. Yeah, so we say, like, if I have to manage you, you're not the right person. I don't, I don't need people here that I have to manage. I want to coach you, right? And I'll coach you in, in, all, in all facets because I'm – I'm on them. You need to. I have three young ladies here who are getting married this summer. <laughs> I've been married a long time. Great. I got some advice about that. <laughs> so if you have a question about that, you come ask me. And so we have, we have those. Yeah, you know, we can have those discussions too. Um, and you know, a lot of biz owners are like, yeah, but what if they get really good and they leave? I go, what if they don't get really good and they stay? <laughs> what if they stay five years and they're the same person they are today? Like that's horrible. You know, we are talking about, you know, what you don't want to do that you don't do anymore and stepping into from entrepreneur to CEO. And that's a mindset thing for some people, right? Yep. So talk about ERISA and brief writing. So ERISA is a, is a niche practice of ours. Uh, we represent people who've been denied the long-term disability insurance, not social security, but long-term disability insurance claims involves um, reading files that are 1,500, 2,000 pages. It, recall, it involves writing appeals and writing uh, briefs for federal judges. And I would say to my coach, because I've had a, a, a personal corporate mindset coach for five years, beginning we met weekly, now we meet once a month. I said, like, how can I scale? I, I can't scale this, right? Because I hate all that writing or I grew to hate it. Like, it's a lot of work. And uh, I said, nobody else could be able to do it. I have to, how, how can I teach him? He goes, well, we don't know. His name is Sammy. He said, he says, Ben, we don't know until we ask the universe to answer that question. I go, Tell me more about that. He says, what we need to do is to be able to articulate exactly who we're looking for, the avatar who out there. I said, well, you know, smart lawyer doesn't need to be licensed here because they're, they're writing in the background. And, you know, I'm reviewing their stuff. Attention to detail. Great. Start to tell all your friends that this is what you're looking for. All right, I'll do it, but it's not going to work. So I did it. Well, then I discovered this thing, the Military Spouse Legal Network. Wow. Think about it. You got to be licensed in every state. Your, let's say your spouse is in the military. They get transferred across state lines. It's hard to get a law license, right? It's stupid, but it's hard to get a law license easily as you move with your spouse. Oh, there's this whole world out there of really, really smart lawyers who are running at-home businesses, Jeremy, doing what? Writing briefs, reading files. Holy cow. Now, what was really cool was that because they were really smart and because we had a playbook, we could teach them the playbook. And boom, we were able to, we were, we, and that enabled us to be able to scale that business really from a, for us at that time, at about $200,000 a year revenue, part of the business to over a million dollars um, last year. Because I was very clear and intentional on who we were looking for. And I, and I just left it, I only needed to find a couple of them, left it to the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, like the world, to answer my question and to, and to fulfill my wish. And then I had to say, you know what? Um, even if they don't do it quite as well as I do, but can get me 80% of the way there, now I get to work on the 20% and now really the 5% of what I call, Jeremy, I put, I put really good icing on really good cakes now. I don't bake the cakes. Before you now, you do what you want to do, right? And you hand it off. 
in over and maybe in the beginning you kind of were really resistant to it and now you've embraced it do you have a specific process like right now let's say you know you have stuff that creeps up that you realize okay i need to get this off my plate do you have a process for evaluating certain things then once you evaluate it like getting rid of it i'm a i'm a holy if you're not listening if you're not watching the video i'm holding up a journal so i have been a big journalist uh for the last five or six years uh writing my i joke with my kids i'll have a lot of material for my family um but what but always a page in the journal is a line down the page stuff i hate doing <laughs> stuff is I this like an everyday journal like you journal uh, every day this particular one is the self journal so it's in quarters mm-hmm. i also am a big fan of the passion planner so i actually am working out of two one's kind of business and one's kind of personal um but yeah it was it was creating that list of things that you do during the day or during the week and just okay, I don't like doing that. Just write it down. Don't don't worry about how we're going to solve that problem right now. Let's just write it down. And over time, looking at that list of things I don't like doing, you say, you know, I really don't need to do this thing. If If nobody did it, it wouldn't affect the business. All right. Email. Email is like one of those things. I mean, I do email, but I don't feel bad if I don't respond to all of the, in my world, all the vendors and people that are pitching me stuff, like I don't have to respond to all that stuff. Um, and, and so either, okay, I don't need to do it and it's not gonna change anything, or, okay, I shouldn't feel guilty. I'm gonna delegate this to somebody else. I'll tell you, you know, we can talk about my friend who runs a Chick-fil-A unit here in a second. Um, or I'm gonna find someone who, the thing is, I don't like to do it, but it's important. And now from Dan Sullivan, you know, strategic she, coach world, who, who, not how, like who could really do it? And it really was how we scaled the ERISA practice. Let me find someone who can do this, right? And we teach them what I need to teach them and boom, get a friend. I think it's a great example for your listeners. He, run, he runs a one unit Chick-fil-A here. They tell me one year he's working. So they're closed Thanksgiving, I think, Thanksgiving day. But he's in there for five hours preparing the place. He's the, he's the owner. He's the owner of the unit, and he's doing $12, $15 an hour work. Why? Because he said to himself, oh, my people deserve, they would want, no one else would want to work on Thanksgiving. Lo and behold, his team was mad at him. Two reasons. Number one, a lot of his team weren't born in America. So Thanksgiving doesn't hold for them the special place that it, made, that it does certainly for us, number one. Number two, they said, you're, you're depriving me of the opportunity to make more money for my family because you were stupid enough, he tells the story, stupid enough as the owner to think that you were the only one that should be in here slicing the chicken or whatever it is that they do on Thanksgiving. So I think that's a very important story for any business owner who is concerned about delegating stuff that they don't like doing and they think like nobody would like doing this. No, not true. People... Uh, either because they're good at it, they like doing it, they need the money, they want the money, they want to serve, they want a different day off than Thanksgiving, whatever. They're out there, and and we have to be, um, um, we have to be willing to do that because to 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 delegate or get rid of these things we don't like to do because what does it make us do? It frees us up to be a better owner. If we're a better owner, the company does better, and everybody now benefits from that. Because when the company does well, as the customers and the clients do well, now you can afford to pay more. You can offer more benefits. You're going to have a happier crew, you know, no matter what the business is. So it's neat, Jeremy, how this all, I think it all kind of works. It takes a long time. Owner founders typically are running a business because they're good at it. They're good at dog grooming, good at car detailing, you know, whatever, cleaning houses, whatever it is. Um, and you know, it take it is this mindset, mindset, personality shift that goes. Oh, you know what? The world is made better, and my employees and my customers and clients are made better. The more I become the CEO leader of the company, and don't feel guilty about, and in fact celebrate the fact that I'm not the one cutting the chicken. In Ben's case, you know, writing the briefs, uh, at least the first, you know, the first level briefs. Um, we, we should celebrate that. I think it's good for the world. 
You know, Ben, when you speak, what resonates with me is, and it's helped me listening to you, hopefully it's helping other, everyone else is we make certain assumptions. And um, the, some of the assumptions I heard you say is no one could do it as good as me, right? Which, as you know, is, is probably not true. Um, they don't want to do it, which with your Chick-fil-A is not true. They may resent me for not doing the work. But like you said, you can make the company better. Are there any other assumptions that pop out or they don't, you know, there, there's so many assumptions that when you say it, it's like, well, we're making that as an assumption yeah. and we think it's true. But what other assumptions am I making or other people making? Here's, here's the biggest one. And, I, and, yeah. I, and, in, and in mastermind groups that I am in as a participant versus the ones, you know, where I run, but mastermind groups are in a participant. You know, I presented this to the group and it's it's the big writ large is is I feel guilty. When I leave the office, I come in in my T-shirts and I leave the office after a few hours because everyone else is working hard. Right now I'm working and I do stuff that I like doing with like focus on marketing, present on podcasts like this, be the big thinker. Right. But it's for me, it's not hard to do, and it doesn't take me very much time to do that. And it's and it's called um, you know it's called actually founders guilt. So if, I think if you Google that founders guilt, and what and 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 I think the the remedy or the solution for that is to just I'm a huge fan. I read probably seventy books a year, or read and listen to an audible. But reading these biographies of people who have changed the world. They all go through this, the, 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 the process of working, you know, building computers in your garage, really hard, sneaking into the computer center at night, gates and jobs and these guys to, to program, really hard work. And they're not building computers, right? They're not doing that stuff now. They all go through this process. Um, and, you know, if, if you're a founder and you're, you have a company and you're continuing to do the job and, it's in, in, and that's by deliberate choice, like you just like detailing the cars, whatever, and, and it's, it's fine for you. That's fine. If by deliberate choice, that's fine. If what you're looking for is, you know, more money, more freedom, um, more autonomy, uh, more time more time spent with nine children or whatever it is, right? You have to figure out how to be the CEO coach of the team, I believe. And there's now lots and lots of models for that. And the very best advice I could give someone on that is to get into group, we call it mastermind groups, you and I are in a group, you know, with Brian Kurtz, um, is get in a group with people who are, who are already doing it and listen to them, tell their stories. And if they don't tell their story, you gotta be curious and you have to go up to them, you know, at dinner time and in the morning and at breaks and get them to tell their stories. Because over time, you'll see that the stories are very similar. The principles are very similar um, and most, Leaders I have found of great businesses are humble. They're willing to share what they have learned with people who will do something with it. None of us want our time wasted, right? Come to me, ask me for advice, and don't bring a pen and a paper. And we're we're that's not going to be a fun hour for me. You come, you're curious, you're taking notes. I will show you everything. And actually, I have, actually have a program lunchwithben.com <laughs> you send me the sandwich or if you're coming in live you bring the sandwich i'll bring the chips and the drinks because i'm going to eat lunch anyway and 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 it's and i get to meet with lots of different business owners students i do it for free for students retired doctors like what's the next thing in my life like i don't know anything about that but i do know principles bring me the sandwich i'll bring the snacks and the drink Schedule a time and I'll do that. And, I, and I'm happy to do it for people who are maybe listening to this. You can go to lunchwithben.com and you can read all the rules, which is show up, ask good questions and bring me a sandwich or have it delivered. Um, and I enjoy doing that. And I, you know, I, you know, because I run into people I never would have run into, Jeremy. I have one last question, Ben. And first, thank you. Yeah. My, one of my jobs, I had three jobs when I was in college at Wisconsin. And one of them was at a sub shop because I didn't care if they paid me. I just wanted that sub sandwich. So, um, and from the notes, uh, you know, you're looking at, I don't know if you could see anyone listening, watching this could see my notes uh, from this conversation from Ben. So 
definitely uh, taking notes here. But last question, Ben, and I want to point people to check out benglasslaw.com. They can check out greatlegalmarketing.com and now lunchwithben.com and, and all the great stuff you're doing there. You know, I have to kind of circle this back around since, you know, it is great legal marketing and some of the stuff that you do, what you recommend. People love software tools and, and stuff that you use. You know, I go on Ben Glass Law and you have this innovative like intaker with a video of you and you can click what you're looking for. What are some software tools um, that you use that you recommend or that you've heard your um, you know, clients use sure. that would be interesting? So one of the most valuable tools I ever found was uh, it's an app called SpeakWrite. And so it's just, it's just dictation. It's a live human being that's going to take the recording and send me back a Word document really quickly. I am, I'm a longtime user of, of SpeakWrite. I'm a long time. So, of course, everybody needs a CRM. I'm, I was in one of Infusionsoft's first several hundred customers, Infusionsoft now keep. And so we have, we run Infusionsoft in both businesses um, for, our, for our marketing. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I. Um, Is there internal communication? from the team that you use any tools like Slack or anything like that? They use Slack. I tell them I don't need one more thing like that on my phone. So they know they can email me, but I don't use, I don't use Slack. Oh, the other one is Calendly, which I, which I think you're using as well. That is brilliant. I mean, to be able to say to somebody, Hey, yeah, I'd like to chat, but I'm not going to do 27 emails to find a time. Calendly properly set up with the, the times and the reminders is magical. So, you know, whether it's a client who needs 20 minutes, I don't talk to a lot of clients, but they need to talk to me. Boom. That's how we schedule this. If it's somebody who is an entrepreneur who just wants to have an hour with me and buy me a sandwich, lunch with Ben, you can go and see how that's all set up. That So the guy, the guys and gals who invented that, like hats off to them. I would pay them much more than they charge me uh, because that is, I think, revolutionary. Um, uh, I use a lot of, I use a couple, you know, health apps. Um, what health I'm, apps? I'm a Whoop user, right? So I track my um, sleep, my fitness. Mm -hmm. I'm 64. I do CrossFit. Mm -hmm. I referee high school soccer games. I, um, you know, uh, I mainly work to be able to referee high school soccer games, <laughs> which is really weird because you go there and people are screaming at me. Sounds like a great uh, stress reliever. You go and everyone's yelling at everything, every call. I can run with 18 year olds. That is really cool. And, and, and it's, and it's, a, and I love the high school athlete. The high school athlete is by and large, the guys, the boys and girls, young men and women, they are fantastic people to deal with. Some of the coaches, most of the coaches are great. Some of them aren't parents don't know anything. <laughs> ben, um, I wanted to be the first one to thank you. Thank you so much. Everyone check out uh, more episodes of the podcast, check out Ben's what he's working on and uh, some of the books that he has going on. And, and thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.